Hello, hello, and welcome everyone. I am your host, Amanda Weldon of We Did It Podcast, and today, a super awesome and engaging podcast with Sylvia Wong. She is a digital marketing specialist by day and by night. She runs Via Calligraphy as well as the Just Married Jacket, which you may have heard of if you are one of the 140 brides who have worn this jacket. It has such a cool story behind it. It's kind of like the sisterhood of the traveling pants in jacket form for weddings. But before I kind of spill the beans on everything, I just want this opportunity to say thank you to Sylvia for joining us on this podcast. I learned a ton about building a small business, about running a side hustle, about valuing myself as a content creator and a small business myself. And I think that you guys are gonna get a lot of this podcast as well. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. And we start off by just talking about the fact that we are both jaw clenchers and that's probably the stress of day-to-day -day life. But without further ado, let's hop into this episode. Speaking of the grind. I know. The exactly. grind. The literal grind. It's okay. Wild. First of all, I want to start off this podcast by just saying, do you remember how we met? I couldn't think of how, because I was like, God, I've been like following you forever. And I wasn't sure if it was like a blogger conference. Yeah. Or something it's else. very obscure. It's probably one of my favorite ways that I've ever met anyone on the internet. So I was wondering, I was like, I wonder if she remembers. Okay, guys. Yeah, so me. Sylvie and I both ran the Nike women's 15K. Is that, is that how? <laughs> yes. We both ran the Nike Women's 15K. This is my first time ever experiencing connecting with someone on the internet because we did something the same. And I posted a picture of the Tiffany necklace you got on the end. Yes. Because I think I saw your photo and I think I tagged you being like inspo or, or something like that. And then we just connected because we were like, hell yeah, we just ran this race and got a I Tiffany have, necklace. <laughs> that's so funny because, um, so the year that I ran that 15 K mm -hmm. I was like searching for myself. Like, I yes, think it was like, same. I was the nine to five was just kind of killing me. And it was the whole, you go to work nine to five, you come home, you watch Netflix, you drink every single night. And I was like, I'm lacking something. So yeah. I decided that year to run a 5 K, a 10 K, a 15 K. Uh, Why aren't there more 15Ks though? It was very Because like 21, a half marathon, that's a lot. <laughs> I know it got to be a lot. I was like, I don't know if I could do it. Um, so that year, like I, it was like an anomaly year that I was like, I'm going to be fit. Um, but yeah, it's so funny that that's how, because I remember like the allure yeah. was, wasn't it like a fire firefighters at the end that gave us the necklaces? Do you remember finishing? I do remember finishing. I do not remember the firefighters. It was what I do like remember though. at the end. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and it was like raining. And my favorite part about running a race, if you guys have ever run a race before, is sometimes there'll be loops. And especially yeah. because this race that we ran, it was on the island. So there's a loop where you run around the airport and you come back. And it's just so great when you're the one running back and you see yeah, people you see running you. towards you and you're like, I already ran that, suckers. I know. <laughs> It was awesome. Like, I think it was awesome, even though the, the weather was bad. It was like kind of cold after. Yeah. They had some nice stuff where they were like, want a massage after? I was like, hell yeah. You were like, yeah. And where's my drink? <laughs> so I, I love That's the fact so that you. That's so funny that you remember. Yeah. It, it, well, well, because I think it's like the most obscure way I've ever met anyone on the internet. And now chatting with you, it's so funny because I, uh, again, we followed each other for so long. It just feels like you're like an OG of even starting Instagram, like of every time I've started Instagram. So That's I love been, that. It's been a long time since that. It was maybe like 2016 or 17, I guess. Yeah. That year, actually, I love that you said that you were finding yourself because yeah. right before that race, I traveled to Australia to do a solo trip alone. So I decided oh to do the East coast alone. And I was like, really trying to find myself, rocky relationship, all of these things. Yeah. And then I came back and I'm like, of course, this girl, so naive, books a race right when she comes back from a completely different time zone. But, but here we are, here we are. Oh my gosh. We are in the same phase of just being like, what do I do with myself? <laughs> I know, which is kind of funny because I feel like that's every year. I think so in different ways, right? Like, yeah. Um, I was thinking about this. You're on so many social media channels <laughs> and like all of them. It's so um, much work. And one of them you're on TikTok, which I, I love that you are and like very in it because I'm very in there too. Not posting, just like watching TikToks. Yeah. Um, and I saw one recently about somebody saying like, you know why it feels so awkward to, to post on Instagram? 
it's because like people know you there now and they have these expectations of who you are. So all these people are like flocking to TikTok where they're like, okay, I can post and I feel comfortable because people don't know me and they don't have an expectation. Yeah. And I stopped to think and I was like, I think that kind of is how the internet has been. Like I'm an old internet person. Like I started on like, I don't know, ICQ and my I don't remember ICQ, but I definitely remember MySpace. Like every single one of them, I like bounced from one to the other. And I feel like it happens in like two, three, five year intervals where you're just like, yeah, I'm done with this one and I'm moving on to the next. I think one of the best parts of social media is the fact that you feel like you're a part of a club. I've said this so many times, you guys, on the on this podcast in season one, and I know even with Amelia in episode one of season two, but I just feel like creators kind of are a part of this virtual club. And that means that you're going to end up meeting people and making friends in the space. And I think the way that I met Sylvia was probably one of the first people that I met through social media in such an obscure way and it was kind of the funniest way to meet each other as well. She's living downtown, she's creating her dreams and her side hustle and this is the beginning of her story. Yeah. Well, to just kick this off, I love this preamble. This is going to be so easy. This is going to be the easiest <laughs> podcast. I already know it. I feel like I've known you for years. Oh my God, I don't know what we're talking about. Just anything. No, I love it. I love it. I, I first want to know just just how you're doing. What what have you guys been doing? You're living with your partner in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, me and my my partner, Scotty, we're living in Burlington. So we've just been thinking nice. so much about our friends in Toronto because everything that you love to do outside, you can't do right now. I know. I think pre-lockdown, pre-COVID and stuff, I was always saying, I love where I live because we're right, like walking distance to a subway station. So a lot of like going out was easy. You could take the subway, not have to drive, not even have to take an Uber or anything. Um, we would go out to bars all the time, go out, see friends and everything. And as soon as it all shut down, I was like, okay, like, I don't know why we're living here right now because yes. like, as far as like rooms, like this is it. This is like, I'm, <laughs> this is most of my place um, yeah. we're in like a shoebox condo. Right. So I think uh, like a year into it, I wish there was more rooms. Like I would love a den or like a second room or an office or something like that. So there's like pros and cons to it. Um, but we're being safe and I get the privilege of working from home. So this totally. whole time, it was like really, really easy for me to switch to work from home because prior to COVID, I was doing three days working from home anyways. So mm. I was like hybrid work at the office, work from home. So I was just like, okay, brought home my laptop and it was good to go. Yeah, that's amazing. <clears throat> Scotty works from home as well too. His whole company yeah. is remote. Um, and so it's so funny because he's just so used to it. And we've got this, yeah. this mic stand now. He's totally perfected this whole working from home thing. Yeah. And it's been so interesting to see kind of how people have pivoted their business. So I really want to talk to you today on We Did a Podcast about one, first of all, being full time doing your job and then your incredible side hustles on the side. How have you really been able to pivot your calligraphy business, which is so personal, so in person now with COVID being a bit more remote? Yeah. um, So in terms of the calligraphy business, I think when I started out, I was like, it's going to be a great business that I can do from home. I imagined myself like very introverted, just like doing cards for people, watching Netflix and whatever. I don't know why I imagined that because I'm so extroverted. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, why did I think I was just going to like stay home and do all of this? And it (laughs) turned out that my business became entirely events-based and workshop-based. So everything I was doing was, um, I was actually going out and teaching calligraphy workshops for beginners um, to people in Toronto. And I would do essentially one every single month. I've taught over a thousand people in Toronto. Um, And then from there, I started to do corporate workshops. So um, I've taught at Google, Johnson and Johnson, like, like bigger, like productivity workshops, calligraphy workshops, just kind of like wellness centric. Um, And then in terms of events, you know, this from like content creation, there's tons of like branded events and often they're trying to provide experiences. So as a calligrapher, I would just like be cute and sit there and like people would bring their their merchandise up or their cards and stuff and I would just be like what do you want me to write or like what what's your name right and I would just like write names or engrave them onto perfume bottles like liquor bottles etc so it became a very experiential thing and that really 
sudden, like, I think it was March 13th, that was like, okay, like, shut it down. There was just like streaming and like cancellations because I was like booked like nearly every weekend and every month going forward for workshops, events, etc. Wow. So at that point, like, I think maybe a year prior to that, I was starting to teach online courses and they were a little bit more for students that were um, had already taken calligraphy courses and were looking to build their businesses. So luckily, like I had the online courses and stuff to kind of sustain me. And then any of that event shift, um, all these brands that still had budgets for marketing, all these PR companies that were still working with these brands, they just kind of started sending stuff to me at home. And oh, wow. I would say like it was it was half and half of that previous. So now it's just like I've got like a case of mirrors, perfume sitting around that I have to like engrave or personalize. And then we just courier them back and forth. So it's been a shift and like a, definitely like it was a massive drop in that like revenue at the beginning, but it's like kind of evened out now. Oh, that's so, so good like, to hear. Yeah. If anything, I just did my taxes and it was like, I did not expect 2020 to match like my 2019, but it did like not a that's brag excellent. at all, but like, it was just like, I, I was, I was glad that humble it, it brag. I know <laughs> in the end I was like, it, okay, we shifted enough that like it, it evened out, you know? So it was okay. Balancing a career and a side hustle. It's a lot of work, you know, and, and as well, it's a lot of sacrifice and just trying to time block your time and take it away from other areas of your life and put it towards this passion of yours. Now, Sylvia has struck a balance and that's pretty cool. She also has an awesomely supportive partner. We'll talk about him a little bit later, but what I wanna get into now is really how she got her start in calligraphy as well as COVID-19 and how she's had to pivot that business that was once very much event-based to now just inside of her condo, downtown Toronto. So let's talk about your calligraphy business because people are probably thinking calligraphy, what? So your account is via calligraphy and it is one, the most beautiful account I have ever seen. And that's probably your brand strategist as well coming out. So how do you balance having a full-time career and this amazing side hustle? Yeah, I feel like I, I give this advice so often and it's because I have run a business a hundred percent like as an entrepreneur, I have worked full time 100% and I've done the working and balancing a side hustle. And mm -hmm. for me, like it's very, it has this like mindset associated with it. And that's really making sure that you're valuing your time where you're side hustling so that you're not underpricing yourself. Because what happens so frequently when somebody's like, okay, I love calligraphy, I love my art, I want to turn it into a business, is that because you already love it so much, you're telling yourself, okay, well, what would I pay or, you know, what feels good to charge so that I don't feel like I'm exploiting my customers. So I don't feel like I'm, you know, overcharging because I love doing it anyway. That's like, yeah. it's kind of like this emotional trap that you fall into to like devalue your artwork and your, your craft. So um, the way I've balanced it is Every single time, like I started pricing at whatever I was comfortable with, every single time I do um, a new job, I'm adjusting my prices or considering how I should be charging afterwards so that I'm never charging less than what I would make during my full-time job. And that's with the consideration that your free time after work is your free time. It's for your partner. It's for your friends and your family. It's for you to relax. So you have to charge accordingly because that's really valuable time. Like you're taking it away from your children, your pets, your like your own well-being. <laughs> it's almost so, worth more. I always say it's it's worth way more because especially if you have a full-time job and you feel as if you are being paid enough that you can sustain yourself on that one income, everything else, that being gravy, does not mean that you then say, okay, it's like only worth like $20 an hour. Like it's worth yeah. way, way more than that. So um, that's how I've found that balance and like drawing that hard boundary and how much I charge for it. And then really considering that anytime I'm approached with work that I know that I really want to do it. Like it's an enthusiastic yes, rather than a, uh, maybe let's make it work sort of thing. I read this little meme and I sent it right to Sylvia right after recording this podcast. It was just so funny. It's like, okay, maybe my phone is listening to me or is it the universe? I'm not sure, maybe a little bit of both. But essentially when you do a project as a creative, someone's not paying you for the hours that it takes to complete that project. They're paying you for the years that it took to learn how to execute that project. And that's something you really need to remember, something you really need to keep in mind, especially when you're pricing yourself in a game like creativity. One thing Sylvia said to me that 
absolutely I could get tattooed on my body is when you accept a project, it has to be an enthusiastic yes. And I think every everyone who does freelance has to learn that. So I've started second shooting weddings, yeah. which has been so fun and like yeah. doing video work on the side. And you're right, even though you love it, if you undercharge, you're going to resent it. And that's not how you want to feel about something that you originally love or something that you pour your heart into. Yeah. And I find as though being a creative as well, with a lot of creatives I've met, they have the same kind of heart where no matter what the baseline price is, I'm always going to put more into it. Like I'm, all, I'm always going to deliver you more photos because I'm going to fall in love with you as a couple. And I'm going to just have to give you all of these ones of you smiling on your best day. So yeah. that's been really hard. I really love that advice of that. You reevaluate every single session, not like, oh, biannually or whatever. That's, yeah. that's it's frequent good. that like, especially for clients, if, if it's weddings too, right? Like I do weddings, I do events. It's frequent enough that like clients don't come back to you that often either. So yeah you're getting a fresh new customer that you can have a fresh new perspective and they don't feel like you're raising the price on them either when it's a custom quote like that. Yeah, that's such good advice. Do you like doing the weddings? I actually barely do any weddings. And I think that's like a misconception. Like a lot of people think of calligraphers and they associate it with a stationer who is somebody that mm -hmm. um, will do wedding design, wedding invitation and menu design. And then they can also do like the calligraphy on envelopes. But um, anything that a calligrapher does for a wedding is typically all the day of details. I don't know if this is like too oh. granular in the terms. No, you'll, I you'll love know from this. Weddings. But day of details are the ones where it's like, um, place cards, like menus, like table setting type stuff and like signage. So day mm -hmm. of details are like very separate from the stationary aspect. So I did do a lot of weddings in my first couple of years. And that's where I had to draw this like quite a hard boundary because I was mainly doing those really big seating charts, those mirror ones. Huge. I remember seeing you make those huge ones for restaurants too. Like exactly. just huge signs. Yeah. So I was doing like a lot of like large scale signage, which were like menus for restaurants and cafes. And um, these big mirrors, I was like, I don't have a rental system. I'm in this like 600 square foot condo. So clients would drop off their mirrors, leave them with me. I'd like lug them upstairs and like do them over the weekend. And then they'd come pick it up again. It was one of those boundaries things. I was starting to resent that I had 10 mirrors sitting in my hallway right there. Like there was just and like, like no pressure. Stacked. Don't knock these over. Yeah. No pressure. Like there's been breakages for sure. Like no pressure. Um, <laughs> like getting them done on a timeline because often that RSVP list comes really late. I was just like, I don't think I can sustain weddings because it was a, like a high touch kind of client. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, this from weddings, it's like, Brides and grooms are not frequently doing events, so they don't have a sense of how to run an event. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, they need like a lot of like emails back and forth, a lot of communications, a lot of like explanation and education. Whereas mm -hmm. like working with corporate, they're kind of like, yeah, here's the invoice paid and they don't ask questions or anything. They don't care about the style you Get do. Get it done. Like, yeah, they're just like, as long yeah. as it's done, they don't care. Sometimes yeah. like they don't even need a draft or anything. So um, it's a very different client. So in, in the end, like I, I started bringing my prices up because um, weddings were so unsustainable for me with a full-time job, wanting to do stuff on the weekends in the summer. And so prices up, I, they just don't come in anymore as much. So, Honestly, as as long as those emails start going up, I'm like, oh, no, 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 this might not be for me. This is that moment in the podcast where I realized that a conversation has totally gotten away from me because I've got the gift of gab and I was sitting with someone who also has it. This is probably a question I should have asked a little earlier. How did you get into calligraphy? I honestly should have started off with this question. <laughs> We just got I on think, a roll and all I was thinking was, I'm going to have to edit in how she got into calligraphy first. Oh my God. I think, yeah, we asked all the questions backwards. I love it. How I got into calligraphy was when I was getting married in 2016, I decided to obsess over something. I think it's like a, a getting married mindset or something. I was just like, I just need a new obsession. Same way I was like trying to run. Yes. <laughs> like, You're like, what was, is my thing? <laughs> like... I, I'm a serial hobbyist, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. I, I need to be creating. And I think what I discovered when I did that year of running was like, what was making me unhappy about like my work and just like going home and doing nothing was like, I was no longer prolifically creating. Prior to that, I was a seamstress. So I was like, yeah. I love this. This is why I love this podcast is like, let's pull on that string. How did you even start? And every creative has so many different creative outlets. And, and that's the thing. Like I, 
I didn't realize this because I was for years before that, um, I was sewing for like five years. Before that, I was creating something else. So when that stopped, I think I was trying to fill this gap with like running. Hmm. Kind of stopped. I, I was because like, they're the I was same. Like, <laughs> I, you know, like whatever. <laughs> Just trying to like figure out like what was that gap other than work that I needed. And so running was like something for a year. And then I think it was literally the year after that was when I was getting married. And I'm like, okay, let's look for another hobby. And it happens to be that calligraphy was like starting to trend. I was seeing those Instagrams of like really relaxing, like calligraphy videos and stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'm kind of good at writing. Like, let me see if I can, yeah. you know, get this going. I sucked. It was like awful. Like it's to a me, bit wobbly like, to start. It's, it's like a, a tough start if you don't have somebody telling you like what the heck you're doing. And I just like was persistent. I was just like, let's see what comes of this. I was obsessively practicing because I wanted to like find my own style and make something for my wedding. And what I had decided I wanted to make for myself was like, I always wear those like little motorcycle jackets, like leather jackets. And so um, my obsession was to paint just married on the back of my leather jacket at that time, it wasn't that trendy to make them. Like I don't, I couldn't find a vendor to do it. Um, th there wasn't that many on Pinterest or anything. So I was like, I'm going to learn calligraphy and do it for that one month, four hours every day. I was just like obsessively practicing. And I eventually made my jacket when I made my jacket, just married um, jacket, the just married jacket. <laughs> um, I did wear it for my wedding and it was like it was a hot day like this in Toronto. It was <laughs> humid. It was like over 30 degrees. And I, I still wore it for my wedding. And it was a really cute prop and everything. But when I put it back in my closet, I was like, oh, that's kind of a waste. Like, <laughs> I was like you're like, I, I certainly can't wear this every day now. Yeah. And so I had in my mind that, you know, I want to pass it on to somebody else. And at that time, buns, like the, the Toronto trading group was like, really hot on Facebook so I put it on the wedding group there and I was like does anyone want this jacket for a bottle of wine I saw all these people reaching out there was like different wedding dates and everything so I ended up saying okay I'll keep the jacket for myself and I'll rent it to you 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 and you because your weddings are like all on different weeks and I didn't trust them to pass it off to each other or keep it going right. and I think as of this weekend it just went out to um someone and I think it's been to 150 weddings wow <laughs> I know it's so that amazing. Yeah. Like, um, I, like that's tangentially related to like how I started and how I continued, but like, it was literally my first project. Like I've, I've made nothing other than this jacket and just like my practice sheets and stuff. And it's still going right now. It's, I wouldn't say it's like representative of my style right now, but, um, when that jacket started circulating and getting news around it, it was covered by local press and then um, Brides Magazine got in touch and they did this little like viral video about it. So it, it just kind of built on itself. And then from there, people were like, how do you learn calligraphy? How do you, how do you get out there? Like, well, how did you teach yourself? And you're and like, like, I'm out here still trying to answer all those questions. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It, it, it built on itself in a way that I didn't really expect. I thought, well, let's run this fun project. And it, keeps me busier than you'd ever imagine. Like just replying to emails about like changing dates right now for COVID even. Oh um, yeah. So I've still been renting it out. And from like, I think it was that, that was kind of the origin of like everything else. Like even when it got international press, um, a lot of people started writing in they were like, oh, can I borrow it? And I was like, sure, just come over to my place in Toronto, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh no, I'm in like New York or California. And I was like, didn't you read like, the press? Like, I don't understand. Like, what do you think I'm going to do here? Ship it to you? Mm -hmm. um, so then I started new branches of it. So there's other calligraphers wow. in the world. I think we have um, 13 jackets around the world. And it, they, there's a bunch of rules to this like sisterhood, which is you can make one jacket. You have to rent it out for a bottle of wine. It has to be like nonprofit for you. It's just for fun, just for marketing, just to, like yeah. maintain that integrity of that project. There are a lot of incredible sides to social media. I would have never met Sylvia if it wasn't for this incredible platform. But we all know that there's a dark side of the moon as well. You're talking about comparison, you're talking about feeling a little bit less than, trying to show up, feed a machine that just will always be hungry. But on this side of things, the Just Mary jacket, let's talk about plagiarism. One of the questions I was really thinking about was, have you ever had someone try to copy this? Oh yeah. I, yeah. And how do you deal with that? I think social media is so hard because I remember reading a quote, there's no, um, 
original thought, but this seems pretty darn original and it seems like yeah. something that could so easily be copied. So how have you dealt with those kind of things? I think like, God, is social media in itself, like we could probably talk for another full hour about like those feelings of like jealousy or those, those motivating feelings or those ones that like really bring you down. But um, I don't think there's like anything that'll get you as heated as like plagiarism. Totally. It's like, it just like the heat in your body. Like you just like are on alert and you're like, what the hell do I do about this? And there's like actually not a lot of legal standing. I've had like some lawyers help me out with like cease and desist type things. Um, and I think it's just about like drawing those lines in your mind of what you think is like really crossing the line versus it's acceptable. Is and this I've seen, inspiration or is this a complete copycat? And that's yeah. like, that's a big question in anything creative. It's like, what are the limits of that? And I think there's like some legal things about like the percentage something has to change, which is ridiculous. Like, how do you measure, yeah. right? So I have to say to myself, like, obviously a leather jacket with writing on it, not plagiarism. Like that's mm -hmm. just a concept. It's been done before. Like it's like a cool punk thing to paint on your jackets, right? So I'm not mm -hmm. angry about any of that stuff, but I think it, like the times that it really bothered me were people just taking the concept exactly and then using the same name, using the same hashtag and then trying to profit off of it. Yeah. Because at the, at the beginning of running this project, I think once I was like five or 10 exchanges in, I was documenting it on Instagram. People were finding out about it. And um, most people instinctually, I think, are thinking like salespeople or like marketers or like, I don't know, what what's the, the most capitalist way I can approach this? So people would say, why don't you make jackets in a size extra small, small, medium, large, extra large, so you can rent out five every week? And I was like, yeah. well, no, like the point was like, it's for fun. <laughs> I have a full-time job. Yeah. I was like, no, like, I'm not trying to get six bottles of wine a week. I'm just trying to like have a good time and pay it forward and have something that's like, you know, unites everyone is good feelings, whatever. Like a lot of the brides that have worn it have said, you know, I felt like really comforted on that day. And I felt like I had something that made me feel confident, you know? Um, so a lot of people looked at it like this way to exploit that. And I was like, I don't want to taint this idea of this project and project and make it into something I don't know, profitable or, or, or capitalist. It, it wasn't about that at all. So I think anytime I've seen the project come out as like other people copying it and making it about rentals, I'm like, go ahead. But it's not going to have that same, like, I don't know yeah. what to call it, that, that special sauce, that marketing, like unique value to it. Um, that sisterhood. Now just, yeah. Because now you're just yeah. trying to make like 50 bucks a week by renting it out. So um, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know what my advice is for like the, the feelings around plagiarism because I myself am like one to get angry and emotional about it. Yeah. So that, that one's a tough one. I, yeah. um, I relate a lot. So, so Scotty found hockey later in life and I was a varsity <laughs> athlete. So it's kind of, this is sport is kind of something yeah. that is like a business venture as a kid is if you start so young, your kids yeah. might be thinking, oh, this kid could go to the NHL or, oh, this kid's going to be in the Olympics or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you just find it later in life, he's like, I love that I never had a dad yelling at me on the side. I just literally love it. And I just go and I do it. And I read this meme the other day. I know you'll relate to so much and I'll probably butcher re-saying it, but it was something along the lines of, I can have something that I like and it doesn't have to turn into an income stream. And oh my gosh, yeah. so often are we finding things that we like, like shooting photos or doing all these things that are creative and yeah. immediately your brain goes to, how can I make money from this? What has that been to you in life? Oh God. Like, yeah, you know, I've talked like very specifically about it and it's because mm -hmm. every time I've been good at something, um, even as a kid, it's been very much reinforced that like you can make anything like my, my parents, mm -hmm. like always, um, fostered this serial hobbyist in me. Right. So I've, I've been able to do embroidery, cross stitch, like the friendship bracelets, like the drawing, crafting, like origami, like whatever it was, they would buy me yeah. the supplies for it. But thanks mom and dad. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much for allowing me to be creative in every way. And I remember being, Oh God, I was probably like 11 or 12 years old. I was sell I was like taking those little like erasers, those like pink pearl plastic eraser or rubber erasers. And I had an X-Acto knife 
again, parents, thank you for giving me an exact when I put them. <laughs> and like, I would carve um, stamps out of them. So I would like write my friend's name cool. in like a cute like little thing so they could use it as a stamp. And I would take like a dollar from people for like doing it. Like, so I was like, I had a like business at a young age. Um, but that that's to your me new was- answer when people ask you what your first business was. <laughs> I know. From moving Selling forward, that is your new stamps. answer. Yeah. yeah. So it was like, it, it just felt like very validating. And I think that's also how we're taught in society of how to validate art and creativity. It's mm-hmm. like, we're often sold this whole artists are starving artists, but you know, uh, one of their art pieces can sell for X amount of money. And that's how you put that value towards that, that art piece, right? Like how much it sells for, um, you know, when, when you are an artist, like you haven't made it until you have some form of commercial success. And it's like, the success is not associated with like your notoriety or like how well known you are. It's like really like how much your art can sell for, how much money you can make from it. Mm -hmm. Just because we live in like a very capitalist like society around it. So um, I, I don't, know that I truly figured that out until this past year or so where I was like, oh, I'm ruining everything fun for myself. So yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That's like a tweetable moment. I'm sitting here just thinking of so many things as you're talking. One, I wish I had a glass of wine and we were sitting around a fire because this is already getting so deep. Yeah. And, And two, it's just like, what even is success? Like, what is it? I think it's after different this year, to everyone. you've been and starting to think much more about it. I know. And I like, yes, success is in money until the point in which you can afford everything you need. Like, what, what yeah, does it mean after your that, life. right? Yeah, to sustain your life, to, you know, have that standard of living. But like, what are you putting it towards, right? Yeah. Um, so I think with all that said, calligraphy, like, I haven't done it for enjoyment in, in these past like four years or whatever that I've been doing it every once in a while, you know, I'm like journaling, I'm like writing some quotes and stuff, but I don't feel it having that same impact as it did in the first like year or so, because I'm not creating much that is new. I have a consistent look that people expect from me. I have, you know, corporate clients that expect that from me. I have a certain set of services that I offer. So as a result, like I don't get to like push that in any way. So that said, it wasn't like I was going to like instantly like demonetize my calligraphy, stop that. So my, I don't know, again, losing my mind and trying to find myself again, I started knitting. <laughs> yes, you did. Everyone so, started something new. That's excellent. Yeah. And I, that one was like, I will absolutely not like knit anything for anyone unless it's for There's going to be a sweater that gonna... comes out, knit in the back. It's going to say just Mary. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> and then Copy we didn't that. do the whole cycle again. Yeah. Copy that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Speaking of finding your style, I uh, was looking at your blog and just watching you over the years, quite literally, because I honestly think I kind of got to see the whole evolution of your style and you have such a succinct brand. And even you just saying that as well, people expect this very um, true to Sylvia brand. Now, when someone's trying to develop their own How do they know when it's time that they can start their luxury lettering business? Oh gosh. I think that's like a a two faceted question. Um, So my day job, I work as a digital marketing manager right now. And very much I, my specialty is brand strategy and brand feelings and all the like marketing side of like branding. Um, I always try and make this clear to anyone, whether it is a huge corporation or a single founder, like an entrepreneur, an influencer, anyone, the big missing piece for anyone that's trying to develop a brand has so little to do with your aesthetics and what you're doing and everything. It's tying all of that together with what your values actually are. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding like what it is that you stand for and consistently standing for that throughout the years and throughout time um, and not relying on, you know, the look and feel of what you do or the actual what you do. I think like saying, okay, I was like a, a freaking runner for like a year for some reason, like then like- but you did it the Sylvia and, way. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then like now, like knitting here and there, or like whether it's like marketing, et cetera. I think what ties it together is like my my sense of values and um, the, the things that I'm trying to find or self-develop for myself. And I think it's been consistent for me where one of them is um, 
really overcoming perfectionism. Um, mm -hmm. It's been around like, just do things or say yes to things. Don't think about it, like put it out there because if, if you're holding everything in, then like the world doesn't see it, you know? Um, yeah. To, I, I used to call it like, just like intersectional feminism. I think it's the, my sense of like, social justice and really speaking out about issues and like posting about them and like sharing my learnings. Um, and I don't know what else, like I, I have like a sense of just like edginess and like, I don't, I don't know. So like, it's so hard to materialize or like to, to come up with for yourself, like what is my brand as a human, as a person. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that's like that common thread that lays throughout and very frequently content creators are missing because what they're trying to copy is mm -hmm. then missing that soul. So it goes back to this plagiarism thing. If you see like someone, you know, successfully doing something and then you copy it, but you're lacking those values, the intent behind it and everything, it's just like an empty, like copy of it. So true. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Like, I don't know if I can relate it to a, a designer brand thing or something more relatable, but like, it's like, if I'm doing this jacket project and in its soul, it's like about building community, which is a really important part of my brand. You're not building that community anymore. You're just trying to make like some rental income with the same yeah. look and feel. And it wasn't ever about the look and feel. It was about like that, that value that ties it together. I love that so much. I've been really trying to figure out what mine is it's online. So hard. Yeah. It's so hard. And I think what's so tough about finding it is you have to test the waters in so many different things. And you almost have to accept that for YouTube, for example. So I've been um, on YouTube for a couple of years, but not really taking it seriously. This year is the first year that I've really started to dive in. And so I'm testing all of these different things and you have to put all of the analytics aside and you have to just get into the feeling of how does it feel to create this? When am I most alive? When am I most myself? When do I feel most authentic to myself when I'm speaking and engaging with my audience? And they feel that. They yeah. seriously feel that. Oh, yeah. And I think like I that. you mentioned like the the content that you were doing on TikTok oh, that was resonating. Sorry, sorry Sylvia. Um, <laughs> Siri just activated <laughs> and just started giving me advice. It literally, Siri think? literally just said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Sometimes <laughs> it's nice to take a quiet moment. And I was like, oh my God. So oh my God, please start stop again. Stop listening. <laughs> oh my God, not right now, Siri. <laughs> God, such a creep. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, with, with regards to like TikTok. So yeah. you were saying like the previous content that was like really resonating with people was... I think it was like your behind the scenes, like weather sort of stuff, right? I think that yeah. that was kind of like um, what I saw was going viral for you. Mm -hmm. It forces you, like the, the TikTok algorithm almost forces you to become so one dimensional and like yes. you have to keep creating this. And it's like, it, it's like appeasing the algorithm instead of like appeasing a person or a user. And that whole separation of like, what your analytics or your insights say versus like what you're actually feeling is going on is really different. Like I've, I've walked through this, like in, in stories and stuff before, but if you just look at like, Oh, what are the most liked post posts? Like it's going to look really different than your most engaged posts, which is like who actually mm. comments on them. Um, and it's also going to look really different from your posts that are who clicks the most on your website. So it's like, what, call to action are you wanting from people or like what what are you looking for in connections and I think that like engagement one is the most important which is comments yeah. like you want to know that people are like oh my gosh like I really feel you I really understand this message versus like the most easy thing is like just like double tap to like right it's so true and what I love so much is sometimes you'll create a post and you can see conversations start yeah. or people share it and that's how you know you're on the right path a hundred percent that stuff thing is the most valuable hundred percent SEO. Of course, we're talking about search engine optimization, and that's when you Google something and something pops up first. That means it's got great SEO. Well, if you search by calligraphy or Sylvia Wong, you're going to get one of those top searches to be husband. And I think it's because she is such a cool gal and people just want to say, is this my future wife? Well, not in this case, because she has an incredible, incredible, I don't want to say other half, other whole. They're both very cool in their own right. But supporting each other in a relationship during working full time and having a side hustle, that's something that's super special and super important. 
So when it comes to SEO and clicks, <laughs> I, oh I god, also, the SEO talk. <laughs> I also saw the people who are very interested in who your husband is, which I think That's is right. because they're like, is this woman single? She is stunning. She is talented. <laughs> she is creative. She is a businesswoman. Funny. But no, no. By a calligraphy, mad husband. <laughs> she is taken. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it that turned out to be so like funny. a common autocomplete. And I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. So for anyone listening, if you, I mean, please don't do this, but if you Google your name, <laughs> some things will come up. Unfortunately, because I was a weather presenter, Amanda Walden Legs is one for me. And that's kind of unfortunate. Stop it. But you know what? It happens. <laughs> It's, it's a sad reality. But for Sylvia, it was questions about your husband. Now, besides the funny yeah. part of that being the SEO for you, yeah, I was also reading through a couple of your posts. And I think um, from what you've projected online, which I know is only a little snippet of, of someone's actual life, but I feel as though we have a very similar partnership. And I just want to know how your partner, Matt, deals with you having all of these things deals with is the wrong phrase, by the way, manages and, and supports you within all of these different things and how important that is to a strong relationship. Oh yeah. Um, when we started dating in, it was 2003 or something like we've been like together forever. Um, I had a live journal and I would just like, I, I used my live journal to communicate to everyone because I was like, I was living alone for the first time. I was like, here's my life. Here's how I'm feeling and stuff like that. And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Stop it right now, Sylvia. <laughs> Don't do this to me. Like a Not blog? That much older. Yeah, it's, it's a blog, but it was like the first of blogging. Like there was, there was Can no Can people like, see you typing? No, it was, it was okay. like a blog. Yeah. It was equated to blogger or WordPress. So it was called Live Journal, but uh, there was a lot of, I know, I was like, oh my God. Um, <laughs> but in terms of communities and stuff, you could like build community there. You could just have your own blog. So I had, I had one there and it's funny that you mentioned like where you met me and I'm like, oh, thank God it's in recent years because some people know me from Live Journal. Oh, no way. Yeah. Wow. Like some people are like, I remember you from Live Journal. Like it was like just me and there was like me and my sister and stuff. And so yeah. my husband's always been around for me living my life very publicly. Like mm -hmm. I've always just been like, here's what's going on with me. Like, this is where I'm at. Here's what I did for fun. Like live journal was like, I went to this party. I'd post pictures of it <laughs> um, on, on Facebook. I would do it. And he has never had a live journal. He's never had like anything. So he's very mm -hmm. like not an online person. Um, so I think he's used to it in my, my antics and my comfort with just like recording myself or taking pictures and documenting everything um but yeah he is amazingly supportive in that like he cooks every meal for me <laughs> he's yes like, yeah he's like my house but husband so he like maintains the house like that that whole imbalance of like emotional labor and stuff he's like mm -hmm. the emotional labor person he does like the groceries and the cooking and the cleaning and everything just because I'm like doubly busy you're on the go Things may I'm, shift. I feel like there are different yeah. seasons in life where you take on different parts and different roles. I agree. Like, I think at, at the time, like now it's like that. And my pre-COVID busy life was, I looked at my calendar and it was like a Monday to Friday where every single night I had an event after work. So oh. doing work nine to five, then every single night I had a different event. And after some events, I like went out after or met someone after. And I was like, <laughs> what the, I don't, have, I don't have the energy for that now. I yeah. really don't like this call done. Like that's it for today. You Same. Know? I was saying that to Scott. I was like, Ooh, two o'clock to three. That's when I'm usually winding down energy wise. But yeah. that's, that's when we're I'm recording. Like, I'm going to be tired after. I like that you said that you're more extroverted as well, because I think we're on the same personality level with that. And I just heard the phrase omnivert the other day, yeah. and I've never related to something so much because I definitely recharge alone, but I energize around people. And I think recharge and energize are just completely different things. That makes sense. Yeah. The recharging, like I like to just like look at my phone or just like not talk. Cause like after talking a lot, like after today, like I've had mm -hmm. business meetings before earlier today too. I'm just like, I don't want to talk anymore. Let's talk about the final ins and outs of being a vendor. Yeah. You're showing up to an event. You got to show up in a big way, a professional way. And there are definitely some do's and don'ts in the biz. I could tell you about the photography side of things for weddings and events another time, but let's talk Sylvia and what she's learned from being a top end calligrapher for some pretty incredible brands. 
at events, I'm sure you have to do a lot of the, um, just the little, the little schmoozing, the little chats, which also take a lot of energy out just yeah. because, you know, you only have one moment to make an impression and then they're kind of gone and you want to leave a good one. You never know who's there, who's yeah. watching. I've yeah. certainly learned that from my life. Um, do's and don'ts of being a vendor. If you're someone out there who's listening, who's a freelancer, no matter what you're in, say you have a soda pop business or you're a calligrapher, what are the do's yeah. and don'ts of being a vendor? Oh God. Um, I always say like we, in that teaching of courses and stuff, we have this whole outline of doing your discovery session and your discovery phase thoroughly. So you're asking all the questions in advance. So before you show up to an event, find out the dress code, find out mm. what time you are expected to be there, what time you're expected to leave, what you need to bring, any just in case stuff. So that as a vendor, you always look 100% prepared. So if it means like taking double the equipment you need to and showing up twice as early, do all of that so that you are making a good impression to the brand, to whoever it is that you're representing. And I think that discovery is like a huge part of it. I think dress code is always really stressful, <laughs> right? You so, always look so sleek though. I was going to say you. chic and sleek at the same time. So I was going to say chic. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It's like I, being ready for it. It's like, you mm -hmm. don't feel like a fool when you show up, if you're like over underdressed, et cetera. Right. I always rather be overdressed, which is why at every event I wear my prom dress. <laughs> Just kidding. Could you imagine? It's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. It's a little OTT though. Um, yeah. I really like that advice because even Rachel, who I've been learning from, I've been second shooting with her at weddings mm -hmm. and she will always meet the couple before, of course, and they'll do yeah. an engagement session. And she's even said to me, yeah, there's some couples I just haven't accepted their wedding because I didn't necessarily believe in their love. And I know that sounds so harsh and I'm sure that's very far oh and few God. in between. But if, if you're a freelancer and you're only doing so many and you want it to really represent you, you want it to be the right fit. Like how you said, right. it needs to be a yes with an exclamation point. That's a hard lesson to learn. It is a hard lesson to learn. And that whole boundary resentment balance is mm -hmm. like making sure that you know you're, you've got your enthusiastic yes or a no. And the no can be because not good value fit, like not good timing fit, it just doesn't fit in your life, you're too busy, like whatever it is, budgets, etc. Like, you should feel comfortable saying no, because like, in, in any kind of business, it's always like more, more, more is good. And that is not the case. Like, mm -hmm. you're gonna end up hating your business even sooner and resenting your clients even sooner if you don't absolutely not worry about having to say no, or, um, you know, like sending out quotes and stuff where people just ghost you. It's yes. fine. Yeah. It's it's okay. Like you don't have to have that, like follow up a million times and make sure like they know everything they have. Like, I think, I don't know, maybe like less than 50% even write back to me. And I'm like, it's okay. Like whatever. They're yeah. Just, they're, they you just have to it. assume they're doing their work. They're doing their research. And, and that's another email I don't have to answer. Exactly. It's like, once you like close it off, it's like, it's okay. Like don't, don't dwell over like that ending of a communication because not everyone is going to be for you. What's one of the biggest things that you've learned through having this business, maybe through a mistake or even a triumph? I think it's like, it's definitely on the end of over communicating at the onset mm -hmm. or like completely understanding what the project is. Yeah. And I know that like, if you have packages, like if you're talking about like wedding photography, there is something like, you know, set where you know, how much time it's going to take, you know, what day you're going to be there, like how many images and stuff. But with something really custom, like offering services, there's always exceptions. Like you think at the onset, I was like, okay, envelopes, there can be only so many lines, like it's going to be whatever ink. You have to think about the fact that like, if it's black ink versus gold ink, this one's a lot harder that, you know, sometimes 12 Main Street is one line, but sometimes it's going to be like 2839 dash 105 Shepherd Avenue West unit, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, it's just going to be like, there's exceptions to everything. And to ask those questions in advance is to not look like you're unprepared, but it's to prepare you for everything so that you're not shocked by when you put a quote out there and then you get taken advantage of because mm. there's so often those things that you don't talk about and then like you're too fearful to say like oh well like I didn't make it clear but if you had asked me that like I would have charged you this much more or this much more so it's like looking at everything and seeing every situation asking in advance and not feeling like a fool for asking those questions 
That's such good advice. I know I've had moments where when I was first learning and doing video work, I would do something and then go back and be like, I can't charge them more now. And it's just because I said yes without getting all of that information. That's so, so I'm on that page too. Like I often, like I won't do it because I'm like, that's what I promised. So Mm -hmm. it's just like, if you could turn back time, it's that like what you would call a discovery phase, a like research phase, or just like getting all the information down so that you know, exceptions. I think rush fees are something that are like really underestimated, but they're like always written down rush fees. It's like as high as a hundred percent for a one day turnover. Wow. I mean, yes though. Yes. Because you got to drop everything else. You got to drop everything else, every other project, like everything in your life to do it a hundred percent. Like brands will pay that all the time. Yeah. Um, when it comes to your classes online, this is so cool. You offer so many different classes and teachings and even um, outlines that you can purchase. What mm. can you tell us about the full gamut of that? If someone's listening, really wanting to learn. Yeah. Um, so I started doing online classes with my like calligraphy bestie um, in <laughs> Montreal. And basically we had like really equivalent trajectories in our businesses where we were doing the same thing. Similarly, um, Jody, my friend, she was working for luxury brands as well out in Montreal. So it was like very equivalent um, events. And what we started seeing was there was a pattern in what people were asking us, which was like, not just the how you learn calligraphy and how you get started, but was everyone that was like just one step further in there where they knew how to do calligraphy, Mm -hmm. but they were trying to figure out how do I run a business and then increase my prices, appeal to luxury clients? How do I invoice them? How do I make these contracts and everything? So we started to build out courses that were really, really, really specified to what I think an outside person would say is like ridiculously specific, (laughs) but when you get into any niche, there's like a niching further and further and further. Mm -hmm. So um, it's essentially courses for people who are already into calligraphy, already creating, but looking to find their way into appealing to higher end clients rather than that, like dollar calligrapher or someone on Etsy or whoever can just like quickly do their service. So it's that like brand association. Um, So we created these online courses as a resource just because we were doing like custom coaching a lot. And that was like a lot of energy. And we're like, let's just put all this information in one great place. Um, And we started the Someday Art Club. So on there. (laughs) I'll do it someday. Yeah. Someday (laughs) Art Club. Um, On there, you can learn all of these things about like pricing fairly. Um, once you do get into pricing, there's this whole conversation of like hourly versus service versus project pricing. And so we talk a lot about value-based pricing, like how much value you're adding to um, a brand or like their event. Um, And from there, like it's just like compiled into having a luxury lettering course, one about engraving. So upgrading your skills so that you can offer something even higher end and then getting into also marketing, which is one of those things that I'm constantly asked about, which is, SEO, how to market yourself, (laughs) social media, like having a consistent brand all around. So that's our art school. I wish we could like promote it right now, but um, Jody is on mat leave. So we're like temporarily closed our doors to new registrations, but we have a waiting list. Oh, join the waiting list. I, one thing you said there that immediately sparked something in me was the fact that often creators and freelancers, they'll be asked for a rate and people will ask them, oh, but how much time does that take? Because they're just breaking it down in that, oh, it'll be this much, this many hours Mm -hmm. for videography. I know that it's usually one hour of shooting equates to three hours of editing and people don't see that part. Um, as well as just all of the talent it takes, all the work that it takes, everything that you bring to the table. Your equipment. All of your equipment, for goodness sake. Um, I think that's a really good point, especially if you're listening and you're considering being in freelance. When you're pricing yourself, don't put down the fact that you have all of these other things behind you that you had to learn to even get to that point. I think that's so, so, so important. Hourly is like a huge basis. It's so often like, what is your hourly? And then people can like feel like they have an idea. But it's this idea that if you can just like use hourly as your internal guide, when you price out, you use positioning and just like calculate, you know, is it going to be worth my hourly and never tell the hourly to the client? No, no, never tell the hourly to the client. And it's that's like, probably unless, a big learning lesson. Unless it's just to sit there in a, in a store. Like we, I do a lot of retail events where it's just like, you sit in this luxury store, they want you to sit there for eight hours. Mm-hmm. Hourly is great because like 
go over an hour, I'll sit there for another hour. I'll do unlimited work within that time. But anything else priced hourly is like, you're kind of screwing yourself. And because if you're fast, um, if you're efficient, you'll get paid yeah. less. Yeah. And so I, I have signs already in a, ca- in a cafe downtown and they wanted me to come back and they were just like, these are the changes. And I made the mistake of being like, seems like it'd be about four hours of work. So here, here's my hourly for that. And I'll, I'll come mm-hmm. in. And they were like, can you do it like twice as fast? And I was like, I don't think you get it. Like, <laughs> Like, that's, that's all I gave the hourly. I was like, I can do half of it then. Um, that was my mistake. Yeah. And I made that mistake literally like months ago. So words with missing letters can be yeah. not so great on a menu. <laughs> it's not going to make sense. A couple of last things. I'd really love to learn about a couple of your really big wins. Have you had any pinch me moments? I was looking through a couple of the brands you've worked with, Prada, Whole Renfrew, all of these people or all of these brands that you're thinking, wow, my goodness, how would you even get a contact for that? Have those been a part of your pinch me moments? I think for those ones, like I, they're all achievements and the, the first ones like meant a lot to me. I was like, wow, I'm like working mm-hmm. with all these brands. But once like word kind of traveled, I was like, okay, by default, this is just like what I do. Um, so I'm really appreciative of it, of it. And I think those relationships are so valuable. But I think the moments that have like meant a lot to me have been um, when I was just creating for fun. I, I wrote in my journal and I was doing like some quotes around like Mindy Kaling had this um, speech that she did um, at her like alma mater. It was like a commencement speech. And one day I was just like on my phone and I got so many messages of people being like, oh my God, look at this. And I was like, well, look at what? And people were sending me my own post. And I'm like, yeah, I've seen my own post. I realized it was from Mindy Kaling's account. So she had reposted my like for fun art. um, And I just got like, tons of people being like please sell this print and it kind of initiated me like selling it as a print which I I never sold prints or anything before um but that was such a huge win like very validating and very like okay I like I I created something with meaning beyond like you know making money from it or anything but um yeah I I would say that was a really big one I can't think of like if there's like other ones but um, that's huge that has everything meaning the heart that you put into it that authenticity it also got attention so cool Yeah, it was really cool. I think like putting that out there, it's just, I think what others can take from it is you don't have to always make everything about like a profitable sale or anything. I just did it because it was the quotes that she, um, what she was talking about was really inspiring to me. I just wanted to put it like down on paper and have it somewhere and just like spent my time doing it. So it was absolutely nothing to do with my business. And I just kind of put it out there. I love it. The very last thing we do, and we did a podcast, is we do our channel opening moment. And I'm so grateful. I know that you've already listened to a couple of We Did It episodes because you're a podcast enthusiast. I would love to know your We Did It channel opening moment for this episode. Okay. I would say my channel opening moment is this quote. I I think it's by Brene Brown. I, I'm we love her. I'm always quoting Brene Brown, um, just boundaries queen, um, is your value is not based in your productivity. I think it's by her. Um, And I think this is just, it's been so extremely important during this time of COVID and trying to work from home and produce and still work. Um, It has nothing to do with it. Please just create because you need to. Um, Run if you need to. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> knit if you need to. You don't have to make it another income stream. Um, even though I'm, you know, side hustle person, it does not have to be that. Just create because you have to. I love that so much. As a side note, Sylvia, my biggest concern is that now after COVID, it's like, yeah, AC after COVID, yeah. everyone's going to go back into that first lockdown mentality of now that it's yes. open, I have to do this. I have to show this. I have to go here. Yeah. To, and and that's one of my biggest concerns as a creative is feeling that weight Pressure. of the world just to put everything out. Have you felt yeah. that? I saw a post on, um, I think it was like the financial diet or one of those, one of those like, you know, blogs or content places that creates like cute little graphics and stuff. Yeah. And it was a list of don't you fucking dares and it was like did you see it too and it was like no but I love this so it it was everything that was like dyfd so like don't don't you fucking dare go back to normal and say yes to events that you don't want to do don't you fucking dare like 
take on more work than you have to work overtime and kill yourself over a job where you're not going to be appreciated for those things. Like, don't you fucking dare go back to normal and think that you have to spend on outfits that are just going to validate your feelings and make you feel good for a single event. Don't you fucking dare. Like, it was just a whole list mm -hmm. of them. And I was like, true, things that we all used to do. And like, we, we just don't have to anymore because I don't know. I haven't bought clothes in this whole this whole time, right? Yeah, yeah, we don't have to. I picture you literally reading those and then looking in the mirror and being like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to like print it out somewhere. <laughs> okay, that would be a good calligraphy one too. Yeah, oh my I God. have oh. to. Last but not least, can I just get a little riff about where we can find you? Yes, uh, you can find me at Via Calligraphy on Instagram and on viacalligraphy.com. Thanks, girlfriend. This was so good. We did it. <laughs> we did it. Thank you so much. That was such an easy convo. So that is it. That is all. That is our conversation with Sylvia of Via Calligraphy. And guys, I think it's just so cool how in social media you can actually make friends and connections that last. And whether that means having an awesome conversation for an hour, grabbing a drink, or just maybe supporting each other in what you post, it's super, super cool. And I'm thankful for social media and that Nike Women's 15K for connecting us that faithful day. I believe it was 2015. It's been a while. Well, Sylvia, thank you so much. And I not only look to you as a friend, but I also look up to you. I learned so much from this conversation about being a vendor and growing your side hustle and setting boundaries for goodness sake. And I loved when she said that she reevaluates her price structure after every single event. If you guys are listening and you're vendors as well or freelancers in your own right, this is something that stuck with me and I hope it sticks with you too. Value yourself, okay? Guess what? We did it. You can catch us on Instagram as well as on YouTube these videos if you want to watch Sylvia and I or if you're watching on YouTube right now, hey. How are you? I hope you have loved this conversation as much as I did, and we'll talk to you in the next one. Bye, guys.